Now we're going to read out of the book of Colossians chapter 1. And if, you have, if you're there already, say amen. Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 and following. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossa, grace be unto you and peace. Somebody say grace and peace. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it does also in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Somebody say truth. As ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, did not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being faithful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, Yet now hath he reconciled. A few more verses, everybody. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Hallelujah. If ye continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Somebody say amen. amen. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hallelujah! Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Last verse. Whereunto I also labor. Somebody say labor. 
striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul, your servant, who has reached us Gentiles to bring the message of faith, to bring a message of love, to bring the message of hope, and, Lord God, to underline the message of truth so that we as the Gentiles might believe in the one who has come to set the whole world free, the one who has come to redeem the whole earth and everything in it and all of creation. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, now we pray. Won't you open our eyes and allow us to see the beautiful things that you have opened to us in your word. We pray in Jesus Christ and the people of God said, Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Today I'm going to break up our lesson into two sections. The first section, we're going to talk about this idea that Paul is so consistent in doing when he talks about faith, love, and hope. Everybody say faith, faith. love, and hope. But here in Colossians, he does something a little bit differently than we've read about in the book of Romans and other books in the Bible, like 1 Corinthians, where he emphasizes the concept of love and the greatness of love, God's greatest gift to us in love in the Son, Jesus Christ, is by Paul introducing and underlining here in Colossians chapter 1 the idea of truth. How many of us know that in the year 2016, in light of all of the tragedies and, and, and um, terrible, terrible things that are going on in our world, we more than ever need to understand and need to be able to communicate what truth is. If we do not recognize what truth is, and if we don't communicate to the world what truth is, we are missing a great opportunity we are missing out on the responsibility. We are missing out on being a mouthpiece for Jesus and being able to communicate truth. Because now more than ever, people are looking for answers. I'm telling you, people are looking for answers. And if we, the church, the body of Christ, who Paul talks about here in Colossians, if we do not know how, to give a response. If we do not have an answer for the world when they come with their questions about what truth is, we are missing out on an opportunity to win people for Jesus. And that's what Paul's ministry was all about. Paul did not shy away from speaking truth. Today in the car we were driving and my son Elisha said, Dad, it's always best to tell the truth. I said, you're right, son. It's always be best, he says. He says, because if not, when the truth is not told, then lies are what people believe. And then that means that people are always going to have to worry about covering up their lies. I said, very, very profound, son. Where did you learn that? But he's learning about what truth is and and why it's so important for us to not only tell the truth, but as Paul puts it, that we share the gospel because the gospel is truth. The gospel is very true in that if we don't receive Jesus Christ in our hearts, if we do not accept the work of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and guess what? There is a place that you and I stand to go when truth is not told, and that is hell. There is a heaven and there is a hell. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And it's not for us to judge. It's not for us to condemn. It's not for us to tell people whether they're going to heaven or hell. That's for God to do. And for God alone to do. And for Jesus who sits on the throne to do. Only God knows. The Bible says that Jesus did not come to condemn the world, but to what? Save the world. So in all of his best efforts, even in the book of 1 Peter, it says that he is not slack in seeing that the whole world should come to salvation. And that salvation piece is, is where you and I come into play. 
That salvation piece is why we take Vacation Bible School so seriously. Because we know that so many young children will have the opportunity to hear the gospel this summer right here at Mission Ebenezer Family Church. I was asked to, uh, to do Vacation Bible School at a church up in Montrose this past month. And man, I had so much fun being up there with all those children. About 100 kids. About 100 kids getting a chance to, to take God's word, whittle it down to its most simplest, funnest, basic truth in the form of stories and teaching and coming down to their level and watching their hearts open up, watching their eyes, the faces that they would, they would make during the storytelling time. You know how we do vacation Bible school here? And we have all the kids and we tell all the stories and we bring forth a gospel truth and we let them know how much God loves them and we teach them about who Jesus is and we plant those little seeds in their hearts. That's what I was doing up there in Montrose, man, and it was such an awesome time because we cannot afford, we cannot afford to miss out on those opportunities to communicate the gospel in any setting. And we cannot underestimate a child's ability to comprehend or to understand the gospel message. The fact that God, who created the whole universe, my nephew Benjamin yesterday over at Uncle Koba's house, said, Uncle Josh, Uncle Josh, did God create the whole universe? I said, absolutely. Three-year-old, four, is he four? He's a four-year-old, very intelligent, curious, young person who asked if God created the whole universe. Absolutely he did. He created all the stars, all the planets, everything in it. All of us even. If he can understand something like that, he can understand the fact that God sent his son to come to this earth, this little small pinprick, as my father would say, on the outer recesses of the Milky Way galaxy. He thought of us to send his son to come here to save not only us, but all other forms of creation and creatures that may be out there in the galaxy. And to be able to communicate that message as early as we can is so important. Paul thought it was so important to communicate these truths as well to the church in Colossa. Everybody say Colossa. And if you turn with me to chapter 1, as we t turn here to the text, I want to bring, bring our attention to verse 4. Verse 4, it says, Since we heard of your faith, everybody say faith. In Christ Jesus. So now Paul is beginning with God's F word. The word faith. Everybody say pistis. Pistis is a Greek word for faith. Okay? And the word to have faith or to believe actually means to faith. It means to faith. That's the verb, to faith. To believe. To believe. In Jesus Christ is the first step of the believer. Is the first step of anybody that comes into the body of Christ. Is believing that Jesus Christ is God. As Paul says in the book of Romans that he's God. That he died for our sins. Was raised from the dead on the third day. You shall be saved. If we believe that and we confess it with our mouth. 
And so we see that it's very important for Paul to communicate this idea of faith because it all begins with faith. We cannot please God with anything that we do unless we first begin with faith. Amen. You can be a good person. You can be the nicest person in the world. But if we have not faith in Jesus Christ, we will not receive salvation and the gift of eternal life. So our, our end goal is not just to receive eternal life. Eternal life is awesome and it's great, but it's, guess what? It's a byproduct of us putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Because it's the forgiveness of sin. It's not just eternal life, you guys. It's the complete opposite of being condemned to hell. Eternal damnation. You know what that means? Being separated from God forever. I heard somebody say one time, you know, God is a respecter of, of what persons actually want and care about. Because if somebody does not want to put their faith in Jesus, he says, fine. You don't have to. Just know that there is something waiting for you that is like living in eternal lake of fire forever away from our heavenly father and the complete opposite of that is living in complete peace and in harmony with our heavenly father and that's through our faith in jesus christ so we see here that paul begins in verse four with this idea of communicating faith faith in jesus and of, everybody say, the love which ye have to all the saints. So, if we begin with faith and we're brought into this great body of believers, within the context of the believers, then is where we work out the love of God and the love that he wants us to show one another within the body of Christ. They say that the Ten Commandments is broken up into two parts, two segments. It's the loving relationship that we have with the Father and then the loving relationship that we have with one another. Everybody say agape or some say agape. That's the Greek word for love. So Paul is communicating some wonderful, wonderful principles here and laying it out for us as Christians. First, it starts with faith and then he turns now to what? Love. Two essentials in the body of Christ. Verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Everyone say hope. The Greek word for hope is elpidis. Doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to us or for us. It doesn't make you a better Christian to know the Greek word for the word hope. But what it does is it, it reminds us of who our hope is in. It reminds us of how we're to live our lives. It reminds us that of the fact that enemy, the enemy is going to, going to come and try to discourage us. He's going to come and try to rock our boat. He's going to come and try to rock our foundation. But it's crucial for us as believers for us to always put our hope in Jesus and Jesus alone. Because if we put our hope in other things, if we put our hope even in people, if we put our hope in one another, if we put our hope even in the body of Christ, guess what? We will always be let down. If you put all of your hope in your wife or your husband, guess what? You will be let down. Raise your hand if you have let somebody down before. Raise your hand if you have been let down before. That's why we don't put all of our eggs into the one basket. That's why we teach our children, hey, it's good to want to play in the major leagues. It's good to want to play professional sports. It's good to, to dream big. It's good to want to aspire to, to, you know, do wonderful things or be somebody. But guess what? We don't put all of our hopes and all of our dreams and everything that we are into those things. Because those things will let you down. Those things will let you down. I had dreams of playing 
Major League Baseball. Played in the minors for a little bit. Many of you know my story. Baseball did a lot of good things, or as Sammy Sosa said, baseball been very, very good to me. <laughs> baseball was very, very good to me as well and allowed me to travel and see probably 35 states and travel the West Coast, Midwest, the East, the South, and everything in between. And it was great. It was so fun. And, man, I enjoyed it so much. But many of you know my story of how that little white baseball also let me down, left me hanging, left me out to dry. I hit a line drive baseball that took the life of my teammate when I was 21. We hear so many times of people that put all their hopes into relationships, and when the relationships don't go well, all of a sudden people don't want to live. People have aspirations to put, to put everything in their hopes into a career or, a, or a, a business, put all their money into a business, or invest all their monies over here, and they're let down. Then they don't want to live anymore. So, you guys... Should we be putting our hopes into anything other than Jesus Christ? No. no. Is it bad to have plans? Is it bad to want to go and do things? Is it bad to have, to have goals and to want to, uh, to have a successful business? Are those bad things? Is it, is it bad to want to have a healthy marriage? No. Is it bad to want to, to want to have a beautiful family? Is it bad to want to be promoted and rise in, the, in your work? or in your career and do those kinds of things? Absolutely not. No way. But it's the people who have that balance. It's the people who have, have their center in something else that have a greater perspective that when those things do fail us in life, guess what? They go, oh, it's all good. That just means God's going to do something else greater. God's got a, a, a better plan for me. He must be getting me ready for the next phase of my life, the next chapter. Amen. How about when, when God takes somebody home that's close to us? God takes somebody from us close and says, okay, I'm getting ready to take them home to heaven. And then we as believers, we're sad. We're sad, aren't we, sometimes? We're sad when, when people we love go on to, to glory. But how many of us know that God had a greater plan and that's why God took them home? But it's interesting to people in the world and they can't figure out why we as Christians have such a strong faith in God and so much love for God and have placed all of that understanding and, or lack of understanding and we've given it to God and people see us power through those times in our life, and they just say, man, either they're still in denial or there is something crazy, something very different, something very special about their faith. And I'd like to hope that it's our faith in Jesus Christ that is the difference in our lives. Paul figured it out. He figured it out. And that's why he's making sure to communicate it to the church in Colossa. And here we are taking a peek into that letter that he wrote to the Colossians about all of that good stuff that Jesus Christ is all about. Verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Our hope is in heaven. Somebody say hope in heaven. Or heavenly hope. Because it's not just the hope that Obama talks about. You want to put your hope in a government, go ahead. You want to put your, your, your hope in a, in a head of government, go ahead. You want to put your hope in a law or in a bill, go ahead. It'll be changed in five years. You want to put your hope in education, go ahead. Education is good. I'm not saying education is not good. Education is good. Put your hope in Jesus. We have a heavenly hope 
in somebody, in the very one, who will never let us down. He'll always be there for us whenever we need him. So watch this. Whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. So I want to underline that right there and say, the gospel is truth. And we cannot afford to take one step back when an affront of the enemy or of an atheist or of an unbeliever or of a secularist comes at us trying to attack your faith. I don't care even if it is in the name of science, because we already know that there's so many holes in that argument. If science is what they put their trust in, then that means science is their faith, science is, science is their God. And how many of you know it takes a, a, a huge step to cross over the chasm of science because at some point, science also falls apart for people who try to make science their God. But science is good. And it hel it's very helpful for us to understand how the world and the universe and the galaxies and everything work. But it's our best efforts of trying to catch up to what God has already done. Okay? That's why we put our hope in Jesus. We don't put our hope in science. We know that the laws that they're creating and making and figuring out are changing all the time. So we understand that the truth then is the gospel. And who is the gospel? Jesus Christ is the gospel. He is what it's all about. He's the one that we should be completely and all about. All in. Focused on him, focused in him, living for him, living by him, living in him. Walk, yes, walking with him. It's all about Jesus, and that's what Paul is explaining here in the book of Colossians. We cannot afford to, to get away from who Jesus is. We can use the word God all we want. But if we don't ever use the word Jesus, if we're afraid to talk about Jesus as, like, as if he was not real, if we're afraid to talk about Jesus Christ as a God-man and communicate that to the people that we come encounter with, then guess what? Then there's holes in our faith. There are holes in, in our walk. There are holes in our understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done for us and what he's actually calling us to be. And we need to start plugging up those holes. We need to start having the courage and talking to people and not being afraid, even if they say, well, you know, I respect all faiths and all religions. You know, everybody's got their God. We, we cannot afford to sit back passively and allow people to step and trample all over you. And then we justify it by saying, oh, you know what? I'm not going to push my faith on them. You know, just live and let live. No. Be bold for Jesus. Jesus says in the word of God, you call me master, yet on that day, I will not know you. If we're ashamed of Jesus now, there will come a day where he will be ashamed of us. And can I speak a little truth real quick? Not everybody that we see in church is saved. Well, Not everybody that we see here in church will actually be going to heaven. We'll be very surprised one day when we go to heaven and find out who made it and who didn't. Oh, man, that brother made it? I thought he was a backslider. Nope. Hey, where's Mr. Uh, Mrs. So-and-so? They didn't make it. It's not just the faith. Working it out in our love. Putting our, our hope in him. But also in understanding what that truth is all about. I want to finish this last movement here. 
in the book of Colossians before we close. Turn to verse 9. I want to talk about the fruitfulness of the believer. If you have a notepad, if you have um, something you can take notes on, you're going to want to write these things down. Very, very important. Because Paul breaks it down into four things. In an active participle, where we as Christians are, find ourselves constantly in the process of, or in the act of, or never actually stop doing. Look what it says right here, beginning in verse 9. And then we're, we'll, we'll hit it in verses 10, and 11, and 12. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Watch this. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Here we go. Being fruitful in every good work. So the number one point right here is bearing fruit in every good work. Paul wants our faith to be faith-bearing fruit. Faith-bearing fruit. In order to have fruit, guess what? It means that we need to be put into action. We cannot be passive. We cannot afford to just be sitting down doing nothing, sitting on our faith. We cannot passively just come to church, leave from church, and not actively pursue Jesus. In other words, what Paul is saying is that as we pursue Jesus, in the process of pursuing him is when we're going to actually be bearing fruit along the way. I love fruit trees. I have persimmon trees at my house. I have peach trees at my house. I have tangerine trees at my house. And my trees bear fruit. If my trees did not bear fruit, I would cut them down and put another tree that would bear fruit. I know that my trees bear fruit. You want to know why? Because we pull the fruit off the trees and we eat them. I had a peach, a white peach off of my peach tree today, and it was scrumptious and the juice ran down my chin. The fruit is so good in my backyard that the rats from the channel come down the telephone wires and my dog just killed one of them, a big old rat this big. If you know any ideas of how to kill rats, let me know. I don't want to harm my dog, but I can't have those things in my backyard. But guess what? Wherever there is fruit, there's going to be rats. Just know, when you bear fruit, Satan will come and try to attack you. The enemy is going to come and try to cut down your tree. That's why you got to guard your children. That's why we have to protect our walk with Jesus so that our trees of faith do not get pruned prematurely so that they will produce fruit in their due season. Make sense? The second thing, watch this. He says, bearing fruit in every good work. Here's the next one. And Increasing in the knowledge of God. Everybody say increasing in the knowledge of God. Another way of saying it is growing in the knowledge of God. So if you have a healthy faith, if you have a healthy walk with God, Paul is telling the church in Colossa, your faith in Jesus Christ has no other choice but to bear fruit. And the way we know that you're bearing fruit is by growing, increasing in the knowledge of the word of God. Which means we have to be word bearers to the world. Which means that we need to be fruit bearers unto the world. Which means that we need to be farmers. Which means we need to get in tune with what Central California is all about. Somebody say amen. So we're bearing fruit in every good work, praise God. 
Let your works be done unto God and not for ourselves, not pleasing. As Matthew says, do not let your, your left hand know what your right hand doeth, so that you might be blessed by God and not by men. Because if you receive your reward by men, there it is, paid in full. You don't need anything, any reward by God. But let our fruit be that which honors God. The next thing, after we continue to increase in the knowledge of God, praise the Lord, is this. Verse 11. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience. So the third point is this. Be strengthened. Be strengthened. In other words, be encouraged. Sometimes you need to encourage yourself like, like King David had to encourage himself. How many of you want to be strengthened? And this right here requires that it be done to you. The first one is bear fruit. We can bear fruit. It's an active verb. The word growing means that we are growing. But then this next piece right here, being strengthened, means that we are strengthened. And who is the only one that can strengthen us? Jesus. What about brothers and sisters in Christ? Are we not meant also to encourage one another? Are we not also strengthened by the word of God? Somebody say amen. amen. How many of us are, are strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit as well? Amen. Hallelujah. How about prayer? Are we strengthened when we pray? How about those that are, are baptized with the Holy Spirit when we speak in tongues? Are we not edified as well? Yes. And that same edification builds up the body of Christ. The last one, point four, number four, is this. Giving joyful thanks. In other words, be thankful. We forget that this day and age. We forget to be grateful. We forget to be thankful. We, 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 sometimes we've forgotten to say thank you. We teach our children, say thank you. It's one of the first things we teach our children when they know how to speak. Say thank you. But we ourselves have forgotten to be thankful. Not just thankful to God, but thankful to one another. Thankful to your parents that sacrificed so much. Say it verbally. Say it with action. Say it with love. Say it with a kind gesture. Say it with a, don't worry, I got this, Mom. Don't worry, I got this, Dad. Being thankful, look, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. In other words, because of what our Heavenly Father has done for us, we are so thankful. And it's a life that is committed to Jesus Christ, a life of faith that bears fruit, a life of faith that increases and is healthy. Thank God we're a part of a healthy church. But guess what? This church will, will cease to be healthy if it becomes stagnant. This church will cease, cease to be an increasing, a growing church, a healthy place, if you and I, the members of the body, the parts of the body, stop doing what God has taught us to do. And that is why the challenge of being used by God, the challenge of being active in serving Jesus and active in the world and sharing with everybody that we know about Vacation Bible School and going out of our way to invite them and bring them to this place so that they hear about the word is so important. And that's just one tangible way we can do it. We know of so many others, but we're indebted to our Heavenly Father. And one of the ways that He's also taught us to be thankful is by also thanking one another. Mm -hmm.